Do you ever experience digital eye strain from too much blue light exposure from digital screens? Baxter Blue glasses are not your average frames. These blue light lenses filter 80% of the highest energy blue light, eliminating 99% of glare. The past year, we've all been glued to our devices more than ever. I know I have finding history books online, downloading them to my phone, scrolling through posts and finding all the history I can consume on my phone, and then some. And that time adds up. Our exposure to digital light has soared, and our eyes and our sleep are suffering as a result. Baxter Blue is also a force for good and provides a pair of reading glasses for someone in need for every pair sold. This is eyewear built for our digital age. And Baxter Blue is giving our listeners 10% off your next purchase of blue light, sleep, or kids' glasses. Click the link in our show notes for your exclusive discount. This is the sign you've been waiting for to invest in blue light glasses. We know you will love your Baxters, and we know that you will feel the difference. Have you ever wanted a piece of Kentucky history for your home? we got the perfect place for you. The Tobacco Barn Craftsman makes numerous works of art out of reclaimed Kentucky wood. Like tobacco sticks and horse fences, each piece of wood is marked from the farm it was sourced from in Kentucky. Go to etsy.com slash tobacco barn craftsman or search tobacco barn craftsman on Instagram or Facebook to discover all the great designs they have. They make many designs, more than just Kentucky. They would fit great in any home that wants a piece of Kentucky history to showcase. sometimes the circumstances or yeah. maybe where the chips might fall. You yeah. know? And uh, that's what I tried to put in when I wrote my book, you know. Well, so what I wanted to kind of talk about, we want to talk about kind of Brontown history, mm-hmm. as in just growing up in Brontown. And like, you know, I can talk a little bit about the first settlers of Brontown and all that kind of stuff, which you may know as well. But, you know, you, you lived there for, mm-hmm. you know, when you were young, so that would be... And James and my family... I've always said we've hopped back and forth across the creek. In 1909, uh-huh. we came to, Daddy came to Lincoln County. Okay? Yeah. Now, his, 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 his great grandfather, his, his grandfather came first, then his mom and dad came in 1909. Mm-hmm. Grandfather came in 1908. Uh, my great grandfather, Daddy's, uh, my grandfather and his family with five kids, they came in 1909. Uh-huh. 1919, they moved across Folly Creek into Garrett County, which yeah. is Dripping Springs. Daddy was born there. And so then later on, they moved back. Mm-hmm. Across the creek, and then mom and dad. After they got married, they lived in a they lived in Ohio for five years. But after they came back, they lived in Broughton Town, uh-huh. and then they moved in down Crab Orchard, and then their house burned. It was a rental house, and they to rent a house they'd go to Garrett County, so back across the creek again. <laughs> and so then Deb and I have been back and forth across the creek, and now back in Stanford now yeah. for the last ten years or so, twelve years, and ten times in my life is we've been yeah. back and forth. So there is a triangle between. Broughton Town and Stanford and Lancaster, and there we are in that triangle. <laughs> We're going to be in that triangle, and so uh, a lot of times people find that interesting. You know, I went to Gary County for ten years, uh-huh. last two Crab Orchard, graduated yeah. from Crab Orchard, yeah. and uh, they of course was from Crab Orchard a whole life. You know, yeah. mom's family though, Broughton Town, daddy's Folick. Yeah, so yeah. They're, uh-huh. they're intertwined. And cannot well, be. <laughs> you've lived in the same place your pretty much your whole life. It's just within a different yeah, county. Just in a different county. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, that's, uh, like uh, I live, you know, three miles from where I grew yes, up, right. but in a different county. In a so different county. it's like you tell somebody where where you're from. Well, right. well, I'm from Rockcastle. I live in Lincoln, but right, it's right. basically the same place. I've never grown right. up or been anywhere different. Daniel and Jessica never. Daniel particularly, you know, he's sports, 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 and uh-huh. and of course we can't. 
not like Lincoln County. <laughs> we can't not like Lincoln County. Graduate from Crab Orchard, you know, Dave graduated from Lincoln. And so Dave, oh, we hate Lincoln, you know. And the, it's not real hate to me. Yeah. But you know how that goes. It, we, it was just, I just can't not cheer for them, you yeah. know. And uh, anyway, so we, uh, that's just our story, you know. Yeah, yeah. And we would never live anywhere else. There's, mm -hmm. I have no intention to ever live anywhere yeah. else. And, uh, uh, because it's, it's just our people. Oh, you know? really? It's just, and there's something good to be said about that, you know, having, yeah. a, having a, a place that you know people by name and they yeah. know you and uh, you trust them and, and you know the, you know their history. And yeah, yeah. We know names running a country store for 50 years, my grandparents and, yeah. and mom and dad. Uh, you learn some people don't, <laughs> don't trust them. I mean, they just can't be trusted. <laughs> yeah. Other people, you can trust them with, you know, your life, you know. And, uh, anyway, how do you want to start? Well, uh, that's a pretty good start right there, what y'all just said. Uh, if we're thinking about Broughton Town, you know, Broughton Town, and I'll just start and we'll yeah. just go in there. Uh, you know, we've talked about Broughton Town before, but Broughton Town was uh, named, I believe, after two brothers who came from... Three brothers after three, the Civil War. Three brothers, yeah, three brothers after the Civil War, and uh, that's pretty much where the community started. That's where it So... How much of that do you know about? I know quite a bit about okay, it. And there's a little uh, part of Broughton Town that people call today Sopus. Uh -huh. And that's not really the proper term. The, they said back in the, before the Broughton, Broughton guys got there, there were some settlers in that area, and there were some wild pigs that lived about a mile down the road from where the, high school, where the school was in yeah. Broughton Town. So these fellas determined, they're, they're settlers and they're rough, yeah. and they determined that they're going to... Uh, go kill some of these wild hogs and make soap, you know, yeah. not to eat, but to make soap. Yeah. Well, they get over there where the Friendship Baptist Church is now, a mile mm -hmm. south of Broughtown. They get over, of course, the church was not there at the time. This, this was in the late 1700s. They shoot these hogs. They're going to shoot these hogs and have these big kettles, and they're going to make lots of them. Yeah. Well, it turns into much more than that. It yeah. turns into be a competition of shooting and drinking <laughs> and a lot more drinking and a lot more gambling. Yeah. And so derisively, they never made any soap. Derisively, from that point on, that's where the soapers, S O A P E R S, that's yeah. where the soapers were. And then down through the years, it, it's the area's called soapers today. Uh -huh. The soap making <laughs> fell off. <laughs> never had, it never, never came to be. Yeah. But the drunken party that yeah. they had, that it really came to be. But that's an interesting, I think that's an interesting story. And there was a, there was a fellow from uh, Lincoln County, and his his name was Elder. They, they, his, they, his title was Elder Livingston, J. G. Livingston, yeah. and he established several churches in the Broughton Town area and, and Crab Orchard, area, Kings Mountain area, and things such as that. And they said when he first went to Sopers uh, and tried to influence those people, that they said people told him, "Don't go there. It's just too rough. You yeah, know, yeah. Just you get shot. You know, they're they're." Uh, they're just a bunch of drunks and this and that. But he, he established a church there. And the church established there was the Baptist Church of Christ. Oh, at, at, interesting. At, 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 at Sopus. At, yeah. And, of course, then later became the, the Friendship Baptist Church okay. after the years. But that's what it was called. And uh, they gave those men named titles of elders. Most usually they were preachers in the Christian or the mm -hmm. Church of Christ, even mm -hmm. though they really weren't elders, you know, yeah. as a, as a, they may not have even been married. Yeah. But this Livingston man did a lot of good work establishing some of the early churches in this, yeah. in this area. Uh, I know when he went to Kings Mountain, they told him not to go there because the, the streets flowed with whiskey. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You've heard that before. I, I believe, sure. yeah. And, uh, but anyway, he uh, helped establish that church mm -hmm. and get it started there at Sopers. Now, I wonder, too, you talk about the Sopers, because I read about a a group, a group of men that were horse thieves, and they were really close to the Broughton Town area. And I like, feel you know, they were um, there's a whole group of them there running around stealing horses. Yeah, yeah. And it was, you know, I wonder if that I just ran a connection. I wonder if that oh, I had any connection to the Sopers. I don't know, but I don't know that story. But they, yeah. it's, it's very, it's very plausible. And uh, I know I read one time, or I was told one time in uh, Logan County, Kentucky, in 1800. Mm -hmm. They had 37 saloons and zero churches. Yeah. We have to understand there was a time that it was there were no churches. Yeah. There was a lot of drinking. Yeah. And so people in the great, you know, the, the, the great revival, you know, in the early 1800s, 
they decided this is terrible. We yeah. need to. We're we're living like heathens, you know, and we're drinking and mm -hmm. fighting and beating up our wives and you know things such yeah. as that. And so a lot of good people then determine we're going to we need to start get civilized. Can't read the revival and all yes. that. And that and it started happening. And you can see by the end of the eighteen hundreds. And then leading into the early 1900s, people, the lottery was gone. The gambling yeah. was gone. I mean, you know, a lot of that stuff was gone. And it was a good thing. And then later on, of course, prohibition would actually come into being, you know. And then uh, seemingly now we have turned the corner back and leaned yeah. the other way. You know? Yeah. And it became such a issue uh, with gambling and things like that that we say all the time, I bet you it rains today. Yeah, things such as that. We're not have no. We're not having any intention of betting anybody yeah. any money that's going to. But that became part of our, our, our world. Thing. It was such a common thing. Yeah. And uh, so Brumptown was not exempt from that. It was a very very rough place, uh -huh. and uh, just as about all the places were rough. Yeah. The people had no education, and there was no police force. You you had to take care of your family. Yeah. And your clan, and that's exactly that came you know from Scotland and Ireland. And a lot of those people were Scotch Irish people that came mm -hmm, to this country, mm -hmm. and that is exactly what they did. It yeah. was a lot of exactly what they did. Um, so, as far as like um, we mentioned, the three brothers coming in to settle settle Broughton Town. Um, that was after the Civil War, um, and was it, were they were they Union soldiers? Yes, they were. Okay. Um, but from then, I guess you know you, it's the typical community growth. You get uh, some settlers there, eventually a store, eventually. A, Oh, was there ever a post office? No. No, I was about to say the crab orchard would have been the right. post office. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now then, but uh, how, when did you all take over the store? Well, let me tell you about my grandfather. Okay, grandfather. yeah, go ahead. There. My grandfather was born in 1898. He was born over in the Parlor Grove section on down 1781, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, outside of Brockton, six yeah. or seven miles. His mother and daddy are buried there at the Parlor Grove Baptist Church. He met my grandmother. And then uh, she was born in 1900. She was born down around the Bethel Church area, okay. you know, yeah. right there, about right where you live in that area, that Harness Ridge Road. That's yeah. where that's where she was born on that road. Anyway, uh, but her family attended the Bethel Church of Christ, and my great my grandfather, his family went to the Parlor Grove Baptist Church at the time. Well, anyway, they met and they uh, uh, fell in love, and so in 1917, Christmas Day, 1917, mm -hmm. they married at my grandmother's house on Harness Ridge Road in Lincoln yeah. County. Uh, they uh, were married until 1971 until my grandmother died and then my grandfather outlived her by just a few months and he died about eight months after my grandmother died. Uh -huh. But when they first married, uh, when they, my grandfather could tell a funny story always. His name was Oscar Baker and he was an oldest of his family and oldest sibling of yeah. his family and my grandmother was uh, Grace Harness and she was the oldest of her family. Well, my grandfather could tell a funny story and, and he they were married by a Church of Christ preacher. He was baptized as the Church of Christ before he married my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, that, as preachers were prone to do back in those days, he said, the preacher preached so long when Grace and I got married that I don't know if we're married yet. <laughs> That's the way he described it. The preacher preached so long. They were married on Christmas Day, 1970, where she was 17 years old. It was so easy always for me to remember their birth dates because... Uh, 1900 is as easy as you can remember, yeah. and then two years before that's 1898. So they're, they calculate their years at any time of your life was incredibly easy. Mm -hmm. After my grandfather turned 70, uh, their birthdays were both in September. After he turned 72, he would say to those little kids, he would say, "I'm 72." And Grace is 72, T-O-O. <laughs> he always tells that I remember that just distinctly. Yeah. When they first got married, they moved down, just barely, as you know, Broughton Town is protruded into very nearly by uh, Pulaski County. Yeah. There's a sharp point of Pulaski County, and if you if you walk out the back of Broughton Town, not far are you going to go, you'll be in Pulaski yeah. Town. But anyway, they, when they first got married in 1917, they moved down in, on Glades Road, uh, just out of Brockton Town into Pulaski County. Mm -hmm. And they actually had a little store down there, although I do not know where it was. Yeah. Now, when I say a little store, it was probably more of a smokehouse. Yeah. A lot of people would have a little smokehouse, a little barn or something like that. And they'd have a few things in it. And they didn't stay in the store all the time. They, mm -hmm. they farmed and they took care of their gardens and their kids and things like that. And they uh, uh, would go to the store when somebody stopped. Yeah. Somebody would ride by on a horse, somebody walk down the road, yeah. they'd go and give them some salt or some matches or a candle or something like that. Well, after... 
living there for a few years, three or four years, they decided to go to Ohio for work. Yeah. And so after going by, uh, my mother's oldest brother was born there, Pulaski County, in 1921. And then the family, by 1923, they're in, the, they're in Cincinnati. And they stayed in Cincinnati for five years. And uh, my grandfather worked at the Fox Paper Mill in Lachlan, Ohio. And uh, it's not there anymore, but it was for many, many years, it was one of the biggest employers up there. But in 1928, they decided to come back to Broughtown. And they, this, they settled in Broughtown, one mile down the road from where the school is. And they, they, they started a country store there in a smokehouse. They bought a house and, a, and, and there was a little farm, I don't know, a few acres. And uh, they, uh, they bought that place and so they moved there. The house had four rooms and an upstairs, a nice place. It's a very nice place at the time. And I guess they had made enough money to you know, to be able to put a down payment on it or maybe buy it outright, I don't know. But they, they began their life there. My mother's brother was born in April 1928 and they moved there two weeks before he was born. Well, together they would have uh, six children that lived, uh, five children that died, three oh, wow. premature and two died from pneumonia when they were just little. Yeah. But out of the 11 children, six grew to adults. And uh, my mother was the baby and she died in 2019. She was yeah. the last sibling yeah. to die. But anyway, 1928, they're in Broughtown, and they've got this little, uh, this, uh, little smokehouse store, and I guess they start doing pretty well. And my grandfather was very aggressive, and uh, uh, he was very business-oriented. I don't ever remember seeing him without a tie on. And yeah. most of the time he had on a, a jacket, a suit jacket, and a tie, and a vest and a tie. He was always uh, pretty heavy, and my grandmother, got, they both got heavy after yeah. they were married for a while, I guess, being around the store and the mm -hmm. pop and the candy and things. But uh, they uh, opened this store, and after a while, they built a building, and that was their new store. It was closer to the road, and so they were running this business. And I've got records from the, the late 20s and the early 30s and, and through the 40s of people that owed them money and people have, okay. you know, they would buy things, what they would buy, a, a, a ledger. A ledger, yeah. A ledger, and, uh, and I've still got those records. My, cool. my, my Uncle Glenn kept those things after he got them from his mom and dad, and then now I have them. And uh, I think they're just That's interesting. really cool. They're yeah. really interesting. Uh, anyway, after a while, the store starts doing well. They double the size of it. And then a few years later, just a very few years later, they added on to the store building again and, and made it 50% larger than the, there's three equal parts of the store. Mm -hmm. And then before too very long, they built a side room all the way down the side of the store. And there they had a, a feed and things like that for farmers mm -hmm. and things like that. They sold tombstones. They sold about anything you could sell. Uh, Mr. Fox here in Lancaster, in mean Stanford, started the savings loan years ago. And uh, I can't tell his first name right now, it's escaping. But he said after World War II, my grandfather, Oscar Baker, and grandmother, Grace Harness Baker, had the best business in Lincoln County. Wow. Better than Stanford, Crab Orchard, anywhere. My, like I said, my grandfather was aggressive. Uh, my, his two boys by this time, uh, his oldest two boys, Glenn and Ray, they would go down in the bottoms where people would cut uh, 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 for the railroad tracks. The, the timber tie rod. No tie rod. Okay. Uh, uh, what, what they call it? the wooden things? The wooden tie. Plains, so the, wood, the wooden tie. Wood tie rod. Yeah, whatever. I can't think of the word for it. But anyway, uh, they would cut those. Yeah. People would cut them. Ray and Glenn would go down in the bottoms and get them, buy them from them, and they would take them to Louisville. Glenn would take them. Glenn drove a truck to Louisville just about every day after he got about eighteen years right. old. And when he drove to Louisville, he uh, had drove an old truck. They didn't have a top on it. It just had a stand-up windshield. And I've asked him through the years, I said, Glenn, of course, Glenn was born in 1921, so this would have been in the late yeah. 30s, you know. I said, Glenn, uh, what did you do when it rained? He said, just drove on. And I said, well, it snowed. He said, you just drove on. And he would drive to Louisville and take a load of something, yeah. whether chairs, baskets, produce, whatever people in Broughtontown were making or selling. They would sell it, of course, bring the money back home and then keep a little for themselves and then they bring back a load of things that people in Broughton would need and to sell in the store. So really a big business. Big my, my grandfather little, bought yeah. a lot of the farms around there. He, uh -huh. bought, he bought up quite a bit of the acreage up and down the both sides of the road. And did very successful as a businessman. Yeah. And uh, then uh, they continued on there and then they, as they started getting older, they started, my grandmother in 1950 
when she was 50 years old, they, they diagnosed her with bladder cancer. Mm -hmm. And they told her, they told the kids, they said, we would like to say, the doctors did, that she will live six months, but we can't say that. Yeah. So they, but they used radiation in 1950 to try to get rid of the cancer, and they did. Wow. They got rid of the cancer, but they burned her bladder completely up. Oh. So from that moment on, from 1950 till she died in April 1971, she had to have a catheter and had to have a, you know, the bag mm -hmm. for her urine uh, for the rest of her life. And that was a real problem yeah. because in a situation like that, didn't have a bathroom in the house, did not have running water, cleanliness was hard to deal yeah. with. You know. Now where they can change the catheters often, you know, or maybe daily, they, they could not do that then. You yeah. know? And it was for constantly becoming infected. She'd have to go to the hospital, stay a few mm -hmm. days. And then finally, she was about 70 and a half years old. She died from, yeah. from uh, that complications from that through yeah. all those 20 years. And after she died, my grand grandfather, he gave up all hope. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, we would try to encourage him. No, Grace is dead. It doesn't matter. Grace yeah. is dead. So he lived from April to December, and yeah. then he died. Just really broke. He had health issues as well. Yeah. They both had sugar diabetes, and they both had heart issues. But he really died. He was through when she stopped. Yeah. But they had a really good business. The, the family, uh, they had run that store for 42 years. And in the last year or so of their life, they were in and out of the hospital in like extended care places. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but they died in, uh, my grandfather died in December of 71. My mother and daddy had never owned their own house. They, daddy would not go in debt. He just okay. simply yeah. would not go in debt. He just could not stand the thoughts of owing any money. Yeah. His daddy, his name was Jesse Hopkins, and my mother was Pauline Baker. Daddy was born in 26. Pauline was born in 1934 in Brockton. Uh, they, uh, they had us four children, and daddy and mom had never, they'd always just rented from place yeah. to place. And every place we ever rented, we always fixed it up, and the people loved us living there and begged us not to leave. And <laughs> But daddy wouldn't seem like wanting to go somewhere else, so yeah. we would move somewhere else, all in this little triangle. But anyway... We bought the place then. Mom and Dad borrowed $4,200 in 1972 and bought her heirs out, her brothers and sisters. Yeah. Of course, the place was in disrepair. You know, it had been, it'd been a long time. And so we bought the house and lot and the store, acre and a half, and real laid really well. The house is still there, even though it's just absolutely fallen down. Yeah. But uh, we moved there in April of 72, and that brought me from Gary County High School to Crab Orchard High School, where I finished the last two years of my life. Uh, high school career and uh, and uh, graduated from the, in the life's class at Crab Orchard High School mm -hmm. before they consolidated the next year with Lincoln County High School. But anyway, uh, we, we had known these people our whole life, yeah. uh, and so we'd grown up with them, you know, because we was always at our grandparents' store and helping out around the store. And these were our people. I mean, we knew these people, and they knew us. And people embraced us when we got there because it was just like the store had been closed for you know, a year and a half, yeah. we're back home and we were clean and we organized and, and had a lot of things that people wanted. So we did real well, did yeah. real well in the store. And mom and dad would run the store for seven years until daddy suffered a terrible, two bad heart attacks. And so he was going to have to retire. Mm -hmm. And so at, at a very young age, and he did retire and uh, we lived for about 16 more years until 1993 when he yeah. passed away. But for all practical purposes, my family has been involved with the Broughton Town store mm -hmm. and community for 50 years. And uh, so that's, uh, that's what I got to say. Well, that's, I mean, that's quite amazing when you think about your grandparents running that store. I mean, they were, you know, scaling the, the state by far and going back and forth to Louisville yeah. and selling stuff and uh, really a big operation. Yes. Whenever uh, uh, my uncle Ray and Uncle Glenn would the, the, the hill going over, it, we always called it the East Hill Holler. It's 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 as steep as could be. And years ago, it was the an, an old what I call stair stepping road. It's just like walking down steps. Mm -hmm. It was just from one ledge one to another gravel ledge to another gravel. It was impossible uh, to uh, it was impossible to uh, drive up and down it. And uh, they would go down with their truck. And they could only bring a half a load of these uh, um, railroad ties. There's a word. The railroad ties is what I've been trying to say. They could only bring a half a load at a time back up this steep hill. So when they brought that half a load back up, they had a wagon sitting there in the yard, and they would unload these railroad ties, which weighed 300 to 350 pounds apiece, wow. onto this wagon, 
course, they're two young boys and they're stout. You know, yeah. they're, they were very, very stout. They would drive back over the hill and get another half load, come back up, pick up the original half load and stack it on the truck because it would come up that big steep hill anymore. And then Glenn would take it to Louisville the next time. That's hard, hard work, but they that's that's how they that's one of the things they did to help make the living, you know? yeah. Yeah, what so was there any other? I mean, a, a lot of times when you're looking at a community, you know, you get your stores and all that. Was I mean, besides of the farms and I mean, the school, when, when was the, the school started? The, uh, I'm not exactly sure when the first the elementary school started there, and, and uh, well, of yeah. course, there, there was probably some. Uh, you know, yeah. one room school. My, you know, actually, my mother, who was born in 1934, so by 1930, uh, 1940, when she would have been six, she actually went to the the Sopus School, which was down the road uh-huh. from Broughton Town, the other way from Broughton Town School. Yeah. And so that school was there for a while, you know. And so she went to that school for the first year. And the first year my mom went to school, she was the baby of the family. And she was always seemed like the other kids spoiled her, you know, uh-huh. because she was the baby. And... Uh, uh, she was real shy, and her actually her aunt, her mother's sister, was her school teacher, and her mother's uh, uh, sister told her, uh, told her, told her, told Grace, my grandmother. She said, "I'm going to hold Pauline back because Pauline is too immature to go on to the second grade." So she stayed in first grade two years. She failed her own niece, <laughs> and not because she was because she was just uh, too immature, yeah. and so. Uh, that was the case. But after the first year, mom, after the, those first two years, mom then went to, to Broughton Town. So Broughton Town, I did probably start in you know, the early 1900s, 1909 yeah. or, 10 or something. And they had a high school at Broughton Town for five years. Oh. Uh, for five years, there was actually a high school there. And, uh, of course, they, the school grew and it got bigger and things like that. And uh, so they had a, it. It went from... I'm not positive about the dates, but just say 1937 until about 42. Uh-huh. And uh, after that, it was just too small to keep open. And so they started they started sending the kids to Crab Orchard. Mm-hmm. The kids went to high school. My Uncle Glenn graduated from uh, uh, from uh, Broughton High School in 1938. I've got his, I've got most of the uh, commencement exercise uh, oh, cool. papers and stuff like that. Yeah. But he graduated in 1938. And my my grandmother's sister, Lily, who was quite a bit younger, she was the first girl to ever graduate from Broughton. Their first class, I think, was 1937, and there was one girl, and she was the first girl that graduated from Broughton mm-hmm. School in, in 19... They had reunions for years afterwards, and yeah. uh, they would get together. Of course, it was just, like I said, there was just a five-year period that they actually had the high school. And then my mom's brother, her second oldest brother, Ray, he graduated from, uh, from Crab Orchard High School then. And, uh, yeah. Brock Town was like a lot of other communities. It was touched by the World War II. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's there's a, several, some of the family members were killed in World yeah. War II. And I've often talked to mom about that and how tragic that was. You know, a small community, you know, they bring a young man home mm-hmm. from, and, and some of them didn't get to come home. They just were killed and not able to be brought home, you know. Yeah. And, and how tragic that was, you know, at that time. And uh, But it was a thriving little community. Uh, there was really not any way to get anywhere unless you, you know, the transportation was difficult, the roads were not good, and uh, you had to shop locally, you know, like now we have so many different options, but at the time mm-hmm. you just had to shop locally, and that's why those businesses like my grandparents could just do so well. And even when we had it in the, from 72 to 79, people still, there were, the Walmarts weren't here yet, no. and people, they, they kind of needed to come to us, yeah. and so we had a, had a really good business. Uh, one thing I've thought about uh, through the years is uh, how everything today seems more consolidated, and yeah. that's been going on for some time, and it just makes things, that's just the way the world is. Yeah. But when I was little, when I was little, of course, I was born in 56, so you know, just say from 1960 all through the 60s at my grandparents' store, there was six or seven different pop men that came and delivered. Seven Up had a pop truck. Yeah. Dr. Pepper had a pop truck. Pop truck. Uh, Nehi had a pop truck. Uh, uh, RC had a pop truck. Pepsi, of course, and Coke. Uh-huh. And uh, so it was just constant pop yeah. trucks coming, you know, and different bread men things coming. And we were little kids, and we'd sit on the front porch. And before the days of uh, micromanaging, so the days of computers, the ice cream truck would pull up, and we'd say, can we have a sample? And sure. And they'd give us four or five kids a sample. They didn't, yeah. it didn't. It was just what they did. Yeah. No, no questions asked. The pop man came. Can we have a pop? Yes. 
And so he would take six pops in the and give them to my grandparents, and then we got six cold ones out of yeah. them. You know, and so it was a it was a different world. Yeah, and it was an exciting world. And uh, when I was little, we would do chores for my grandparents, and they would give us a quarter when we go on Saturday. We'd stay four or five hours and do chores, carrying wood and water, and and you know, feeding the chickens and things like that. We'd get a quarter. We don't see much, much anymore. But when I was little, with a quarter, we could buy six candy bars. You could oh. buy six candy bars yeah. for a quarter, or you could get a Coke and three candy bars, or you could get a Coke and an ice cream and one candy bar for a quarter. So it was kind of paradise. Yeah. You know? And uh, and uh, in those days too, one of my fondest memories growing up was picking up pop bottles. Yeah. And pop bottles were three cents when I was little. Uh, you, know, you could redeem them for three cents, and then they went to five. Well, that just was the God's raise, <laughs> and people were people littered so terribly. They threw every pop bottle out the window, and we would walk up down this road with our bikes, or you know, or walking, and we would pick up. You know, we get their four dollars worth pretty easy, and uh, you know, when you when you could buy six candy bars for a quarter, their four dollars was a good thing, yeah. you know. And we had a lot of adventures picking up pop bottles with my cousins and different family members, and. Uh, and we didn't pick up any trash, but we did pick up the pop box. <laughs> so the world is much different in that regard. It is. Yeah. And, uh, but now things are consolidated. Coke and Pepsi started buying up these things. And, of course, there are no returnable bottles anymore. And so yeah. that part is all changed. And thankfully, people don't litter as much. They still need they still need some work to do. Yeah, they don't <laughs> litter nearly as much. And so I'm happy about that. Well, you talk about knee high. And at a time back in like the early... 1900s crab orchard. The you had good winds had koa, yes. and then there was the crab orchard koa, and you know Nehi Nehi bought bought them out. Okay, yeah. and you know that's that's early consolidation. Yes. I guess right. you know, right. um, it, it's interesting to think about how local everything was, yes, was. at at, the, at that yeah, time. Because you think about. Um, the store, you know, you think, oh, why didn't, you know, now you go to Walmart or Lowe's and you can kind of get everything, and it's a 20 minute drive at the right. most. But then, you know, you weren't, you weren't driving, no. you weren't driving anywhere. You know, some people didn't even have cars at no, the time, no. so the country store was the right. oldest store. Yes. <laughs>